think we got it, guys. I think we fixed it. I think we're good. I think we are good. Make sure I'm live. Yep, we're live. Okay. Make sure we can get everybody back here. Give them a little bit. Oh, that was a nightmare. All right. There we go. All right. Here we go again. Grant Kramer is here, everybody. Grant Kramer is here joining us, the star of Killer Class from Outer Space, the producer of um, Willie's, uh, what, um, Willie's Wonderland. Willie's Wonderland. That always like gets me. It's a, it's a mouthful. But I loved that. I loved Willie's Wonderland, the new one you just produced, which you also had a. Uh, oh, oh, there we go. Nice. Is that a poster with all the crew? Crew sign it. I, I don't know where to put my hand on this. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, that's the whole poster that I just got. I just got framed. I haven't had a chance to put it up yet. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So, um, yeah, Willie's Wonderland. Thanks for embracing the crazy Nick Cage on that. Um, those are some of my favorite films of all time when Cage just gets to unleash the crazy. But in that film, he doesn't even talk. He just kind of grunts and yells. And it's a very very interesting. Um, role for him so uh, but you had a cameo in the movie playing basically the charles lee ray of the child's play um series you you're jerry lee willis i think is it jerry is, lee willis exactly jerry lee willis uh who possesses the main animatronic evil animatronic of willie's wonderland um <laughs> so that was a, that was a nice cameo i saw you in there um did you just do that for fun what was that all about tell me about yeah that. just for fun you know everybody uh you know like i was i was saying that um when we were making the movie like you know everybody was laughing and saying like the pitch for the movie the official pitch was was uh you know willie's wonderland at the time it was called wally's wonderland we changed the name while we were making the the movie um, but uh, the pitch was killer. It was Willie's Wonderland is killer clowns from outer space meets Pale Rider. And <laughs> that's a um, great way to describe. <laughs> and so along the way, everybody, uh, you know, kept on saying, you know, Grant, you got to be in it. You got to be in it. And um, you know, there just really wasn't a lot of parts that kind of really made sense for me to be in it. The funny thing was is that the actor that was originally cast. Uh, to play Tex, um, we had a problem and we had to reschedule at the very last minute. So I, we had to hire somebody locally. And um, so, so I actually was, you know, polishing up my cowboy boots, thinking that I was going to have to j jump in the next morning and play the part of Tex. But then we found a really, really good local actor who did a great job, Rick Wright. Um, and uh, then I, everybody said, "Oh, well, you got to do, you got to do Jerry." So, awesome. Well, I loved yeah. it. I loved seeing you on the screen there. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you, so uh, it's great cameo um, and with the little beanie hat and everything, little beanie cap. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a small part, but it's obviously kind of a very central part of the movie, right? I mean, right. you know, even though I'm only on and I don't even say a word, he's, you know, he's the guy who's behind Willie, so it was kind of cool to play that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, how long did it take you guys to shoot that? Four weeks. Four weeks? That's pretty short. It's pretty short. Four weeks, yeah. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, budgets these days are, I mean, you know, schedules and budgets, they're kind of getting tighter and tighter all the time. Um, so uh, we had 20 days, and we had 20 days with Nick, I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, we might have had one day without him, but um, but you know, we had so much time to sh that we had budgeted to shoot, and we had so much time that we had Nick available, and so we had to get it done. And um, you know, th the way things happen is, you know, you get your money in place, and 
then you're it's just a constant it's constantly hitting deadline time schedules you know what i mean as soon as we got or as soon as we kind of got a green light we had to get the creatures being built you know several mm -hmm. months in advance because they take time to design and build and then you, you're all working up to this very limited um this very limited window that you have where you know you have nick cage and if you don't if you don't start him on time you know he's gone into another movie the minute you finish so so, Great. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking of speech, speaking of creature designs, I think we got a couple people hanging out uh, in the uh, green room here that we could probably add to our broadcast. It looks like Edward is that, <laughs> is that Edward? Do I have the right uh, Chiron for you right there? Great. Well, we've got another guy here too that we weren't really planning Edward. on. So this is Edward Kyoto, a producer of Killer Clowns from Outer Space and a master puppeteer who's worked on movies like Team America, uh, Critters, one of my favorite films of all time, the Critters series, um, and just tons of really great stuff. So Edward, thank you for stopping in. We're doing our Netflix show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, of course, the first people I called to see if they would if they would do it was uh, the Kyotos, and um, unfortunately, they were just too busy doing their Netflix show, which is good for them. But um, uh, you know, they were they're always my first choice with anything that has to do with any wild and crazy stuff like this. That's awesome. But it's always good. It's always good to know because you know we're all really close friends too. So it's it's if you if they say no, it's good. To, it's good that they're saying no because they've got a bunch of work in front of them, right, Charlie? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean that 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 was the fun part. You know, it's like I, I never say no. You know, so all right, how do we do this? Because this is it's cool. Because not only you, Adam Rifkin, the script was really funny. You know, uh, it was a bit, would have been a blast. But actually, all our all our friends ended up doing the costumes for you. So you know, Ken Hall, <laughs> and his team, BJ Geyer in Atlanta, all really absolutely, top absolutely. Very so everybody, everybody kind of you know has trained and worked with and are friends with the Kyotos, anyways. But um, that's you know, awesome. These guys are, are my my good good buddies and they're the best that there is. So if I can if you if I could get them, I wanted them. Keeping it in the family, you know what I mean? When you find good people in the film industry, you tend to work with them for a really long time, uh, I've found. I, I've been in the film industry for about 20 years. Uh, mostly I'm in TV now, but uh, I started out as a PA in film. So uh, I had producers that I would work for over and over and over when I lived in L.A. and when I moved to Austin and stuff. So, yeah, I get it. You, you meet creative, amazing people, and you stick with them for life. Um, but I want to ask you guys, since we have the Kyoto Brothers here, um, talk to us a little bit about the early process of getting killer clowns made. Because I love to hear the stories of, like, you know, trying to get funding for a crazy movie about killer clowns. I mean, that sounds pretty much impossible. So I don't know how would you would go about that. How, how did that happen? You know, it's, it's, so, it's funny. Clowns is, like, atypical in so many ways. Um, you know, I, I, I just, it's it wasn't like us knocking on doors on doctors and dentists that we knew and trying to raise the money. Um, it really came from a part of our uh, kind of our creativity. Uh, we had done a um, a special for KAB, the local KABC here in Los Angeles. We had an opportunity to do an after school special thing called Cousin Kevin, and at that time um, we were working on Fairy Tale Theater. And uh, Fred Fuchs, Shelley Duvall's producer, saw it and really, really liked it. And he, one day he comes to us and asks us, hey, guys, do you have any, any feature ideas? So I have some friends who just came in to some, some money, you know, a credit line to make, you know, you know low-budget genre movies. And um, Charlie and Steve had, uh, had come up with an idea of Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Uh, there was a like a 25 page treatment charlie had done a one sheet poster of a clown holding a puppet ray gun overlooking <laughs> a sleep town and then steven did a sculpture of that clown you know holding a puppet ray gun so he brought us over to uh moshe diamant at transworld entertainment and we pitched killer clowns 
uh, with Paul Mason, who was a, his head of production at the time, and we sold clowns in the room on our very first feature film pitch. That's crazy. That doesn't happen very often in Hollywood, I can tell you that. As you guys know, like how hard it is to and do that. And we said, fuck, this is easy. <laughs> <laughs> Did reality set in later on <laughs> when you were trying to get money for other films? Yeah, thirty five no, years we, later. We were we thrilled. <laughs> Sorry, we, we were thrilled. Hollywood has, they a offered us. has a tendency to be a lot like Las Vegas. They let you get the first one going to get you hooked, and then you, right. you, you spend the rest of your life trying to get it going again. <laughs> yeah, Charlie, what? Um, where where did this idea come from? Uh, you know what? Um, we had wanted, well, we came out with a stop motion background. Stop motion is a very time consuming, meticulous yeah. thing. We have to build everything and animate everything one frame at a time. So we were developing features and we wanted to do an animated feature. We had just come off of I Go Pogo in Washington, D.C., Stephen and I. And uh, when we were offered this film thing, we said, well, we have to do something that we could do low budget and easy. We, you know, at the time with E.T., and all that stuff where they were building animatronic figures and stuff. Directors wanted to direct the uh, effects, and stop motion was a more difficult thing to, to sell. So we said, well, let's come up with something we can build a monster for, some suits, and do our special effects, the same stuff we were doing for Shelley Duvall and a number of other companies. Let's see if we can do that, um, you know, for Transworld. And we came up with this thing, um, and, and, and Steven's... You know, Stephen, he said, well, let's think of the scariest, you know, the scariest thing we can think of. And Stephen came up with driving down a dark road and headlights come up behind you and you look to the side and you see a clown leering at you. And that sends a chill up your spine. That was frightening. And for some reason, it just occurred to me, I, I said, well, what if the clown wasn't in a car? He was just floating. And then he said, well, he'd have to be from outer space. And then it says, killer clowns from outer space. It was that kind of a thing, just bouncing ideas all off of each other. We came up with this silly concept of killer clowns from outer space. We said, you know what? We can build clown costumes. We know some of the best matte painters and miniature builders in Hollywood. We can make this work. And then Fred said, hey, I got somebody that's interested in, you know, small ideas, you know, interesting, funny ideas. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I love it. We were, they, it, they, it was a development deal. They hired us to write the script. We So we wrote the first draft in four weeks, the three of us. And then we did the second draft in two weeks after that. And they uh, put together a budget. It was right in their sweet spot of where it needed to be. And then they greenlit the project. And um, the first person that was cast was Grant. Awesome. Yeah, great. Tell, you know, tell us about that. Tell us about uh, how you got cast you know, since you were the first one. I was gonna, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Charlie. No, I was going to say, you know, back in 1986, 87, they offered us $2 million. That was, you know, no one ever offered the Kyoto Brothers a million dollars, let alone <laughs> two. You know, of course we were going to say yes. And, you know, back in the, in the 80s, you know, other people were doing movies for $500,000. We were amazed. I, I mean, I would be but, too. That that was a lot of money back. It's still a lot of money these days. I know people who are making yeah, films actually, for forty thousand. Yeah, know? the actual, the actual exactly. budget. The original budget was one point eight five, um, yeah. and then we went a little over budget, and then they added some reshoots and some things where we changed the ending. So our total, our end, our end cost was two million. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but Grant was again, and then we, you know, once we, uh, once we got the green light, they. We cast Grant, and then we built the rest of the cast around him. Okay. You know yeah. what? The only the only <laughs> problem the only problem with Grant Kramer the discussions <laughs> I know it, he said he's too good looking. <laughs> he that does have some baby blues. Uh, <laughs> I think it, was, it was based on Mike Tobacco, a, a childhood friend of ours, a high school friend of ours, and they go, yeah, he's he's great. He's got the personality. He's got the acting chops. He's too good looking for my tobacco. <laughs> and that was the only well, thing. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I I'm glad you guys didn't nix me be, <laughs> because <laughs> here we are, 30 years later, and it was it was it seems like it was kind of our destiny, right? Uh, certainly, yeah, absolutely, certainly. 
Serendipity for sure. Um, I mean, uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space has become. You know, we're kind of a we're kind of a, fa- a Killer Clowns from Outer Space family. If Suzanne were here and right and uh, you know our Mike, our composer, even like a lot of the guys that were in the clown suits, we're all kind of got a kind of a Killer Clowns family that we we've, we've kept together for quite a few years now. That's great. Um, I, I'm one of the kids who who watched that film when it came out. I'm 41 years old, so I, I'm old enough to have seen that when it like first started coming on television and VHS and stuff like that at the video store. So, uh, yeah, I just want to say, like, longtime fan right here. Um, Grant, tell me about how you got cast. You're the first one cast. They just got all this money. Yeah, did well, you get the money first or I, I, did you, know, you get they, cast they, they first? They didn't really tell me. I mean, I, listen, I I had a pretty good idea that we connected and that, that, that things were going to work out, but um, there was a lot of you know getting the right chemistry between all of the actors um so and what really happened too to correct me if i'm wrong too was that um the the guy they really liked a lot for dave john allen nelson that ended up playing the part both of us were were blonde and we looked kind of too similar so I think that uh they were also a little bit worried about casting two guys that you know kind of <laughs> You know, didn't ha- kind of have o- opposite looks a little bit like that. So, but we well, I that, came that back again exactly, and again. Yeah, I can't remember how many times, but auditioning we with different spot. groups of people um, until we kind of got it down right. And then they said, "But Grant, would you would you would you dye your hair black?" Right. <laughs> so I so yeah. they dyed my hair black so that we all kind of. They, Suzanne dyed hers kind of red. John L. Nelson was the blonde. And I was was black, and also I think their their buddy that Mike Tobacco was patterned after, um, a guy they grew up with, uh, who was kind of the troublemaker when they were growing up, also right. had really dark hair, so it worked out pretty well. I couldn't even it tell. So I couldn't even tell. I was yeah. really surprised you were blonde. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Trans World, uh, um, their their note was because uh, we wanted a brunette leading lady. And uh, they said they wanted, Moshe Diamant, I, I think, wanted a blonde or a strawberry blonde. Yeah, that was, that was his note yeah. on that. Awesome. Well, while I, while I got um, the, the uh, Kyoto's here, I want to ask you guys, because I'm, I'm a script hound. I love reading scripts of films that have come out, and I would love to know what, the dif- what some of the differences were from the original script and what actually got made and made it to the final cut. Wow, um, um, the uh, the original <laughs> just had a bigger climax in in the fun house with a giant. I don't want to give anything away because we might do it in the sequel. But the uh, they had a, a giant spinning turntable and the clowns were waiting with them with weapons to tear them apart and you had to hold on. Unless you know to to hold on from being uh, uh, destroyed by the uh, the clowns, and they're holding on for their dear life on that that classic old old school old time uh, turntable that used to be in the fun houses. We had that, uh, so we toned it down a little bit, uh, um, you know, because of the budget. It was just too much stuff. We threw, you know, we were so excited. We threw everything and the kitchen sink, you know, into the thing. Well, I think that Clownzilla works pretty good, and if I'm not mistaken, I heard that Charlie, you actually played Clownzilla. Is this correct? I was Clownzilla. Yeah. And Confirmed. Clownzilla was originally one of the one of the things that Clownzilla was. You, you notice in the movie, he's lower down on strings because yeah. that's he was originally going to be a marionette throughout that entire sequence, but. We we tried it. We we actually started shooting it that way, and we just like within like forty seconds, we realized that there's no way this is gonna happen, and we we lost the strings. That's why he breaks out of them as soon as he lands on the platform. So we just use it yeah, as the a rigging, rowing. the rigging, yeah, the rigging to follow. You know, we have to follow the rigging to keep the strings taut. So that right. was thrown out. But the the biggest change was we had the Terenzi brothers always came back. But we originally had uh, Dave the cop sacrifice his life to save uh, uh, 
um, you know, to save the uh, Mike and um, and Debbie. So um, and that was a that was a Paul Mason note. He says it's, that's that's too depressing. Killer Clowns is not that type of movie. <laughs> and and he he was right, you know, and he was right. The only problem I have with it. I would have liked to, in editing, done something to make it look like there was reasonable time for Dave and the Terenzi brothers to get into the, the, the clown car. But that's just right. me. Right. I think it still works. I think it still works the way you guys shot it. I think I think it's great. Um, that's, um, oh, what was I going to say? Dang it. But you know what, Charlie? I actually think it's better that you rip the marionette strings off because oh, yeah. it's like it's actually like it's one of my it's it's like one of the coolest moments because you've got the marionette that comes down, right? And then he got kind of he's so he's so badass and he's so pissed off, right? That he just goes yeah, <laughs> rips his strings. No, yeah. you're yeah. right. It's it's King Kong breaking out of his chains. <laughs> but yeah. but it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. The marionette yeah. version. I mean, it like, begs to answer the so question: What was things. operating it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Edward. exactly. What was, what was, Edward just said something. Yeah, it's Edward, funny. So, if you, we're, we're marrying Ed, it would beg the question: What was operating it from above? Uh, <laughs> Whoa, it, that's that's <laughs> Kong's Kong's. <laughs> that, yeah. Um, so a lot to be of determined. Yeah, I would love to see it if there is a sequel. We're gonna get to that. I'm we're, I'm gonna get to the questions about maybe a sequel in a little bit. First up, but first I wanna I wanna say like as a film, you know it's obviously a horror comedy. It's it's poking fun at, it, at itself the whole time. But there are some genuinely scary as shit fucking scenes in this film, especially. The burger joint scene, Big Top Burger, where the clown is enticing the little girl outside. And <laughs> if I can, I'm going to play that uh, for our audience right now so that they can um, see what's going on uh, and the see, see the scene we're talking about. So one second, guys. Uh, and we're going to go to, uh, I think it's this one. Here we go. Here's some more kids for your Here's some more ketchup. I want you to sit still and eat your hamburger. Sorry for the, uh... It's not much fun as it used to be. The, um... <laughs> it is if you're the winners. <laughs> subtitles, but it's the only copy of this I could find online on YouTube, so... <laughs> Here we go. And Charlie, I'll try to get you added on here too uh, in a second. Let's see. Yeah. There we go. We'll just put you over here for now. The John the John Lasari score was exceptionally effective. Uh, uh, I totally agree. You're not going anywhere till you finish your food. Now, when I look at that, <laughs> what was what was missing for me is that instead of that growl, it would have been great to see him take that mallet and smash the horses and that playground apart but well, we didn't have the budget to do something like that to show the audience what would have happened to the little girl right yeah they can they can have imagined it but it would have been nice to show him just knock the head off of the horse he was riding well it's funny that scene had a different had a different button on it um the original yeah. intent as written was as the little girl is reaching towards the door the mom comes in really abruptly and grabs the hand and kind of gives us a false scare. Um, but then um, it's some um, test screenings and stuff. It was decided to, to change it. They didn't want the mom to be mean to the little girl. Right. 
Right. So to me, like the I yeah. would have loved to have seen it play out as we had originally intended, because it would have been in right. that little fast, that false scare. And I think it would, without it, what Charles says makes it even more. The scene ends like a little flat for me. I think the false scare would have would have been a, a, a different option. I think that little girl is now yeah, a. A mom living in Colorado. <laughs> hey, the perfect the perfect button would have been to have the mom come out being really mean, and the, the clown hits her on the clown gets her. Yeah, I didn't get that. <laughs> that's something. We, that's something we do now in, in 2020. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, no, but, child uh, service is clown. Everybody has their own favorite scene. And that's that's one of the good ones. There's uh, there's other really scary scenes. And li looking at it now, we were a little light on it. We made it a more of a family friendly thing. Um, if we were to get a, a chance to do it, I would like to go a little scarier, you know, but still keep the same fun tone. Oh, abs a little absolutely, creep. absolutely. I mean, but that's not the only scary scene. I mean, there's some great stuff yeah. in there. Um, like, yeah, for, uh, for me, it's just funny. The, the movie takes on, the, you know, the, the first half of the movie, it's pretty light and fun, you know, the, the, what's going on. But as soon as uh, the clown walks into the police station this for the second, you know, the first time when Mooney, after the punks, the little punk rocker guys get thrown in jail, the movie takes on a different tone at that point. It's uh, Especially when Dave goes back to the police station. Then we're into our full-on scary movie. Yeah, that was the well, other scene. See. Yeah, that I wanted to talk about the the puppet scene where Mooney gets turned into a puppet. That was absolutely terrifying as well for me. As well, a that's kid. where it wasn't fun in games anymore. You know, the audience sense. got to see that these clowns were serious. Right. You, you laughed at the you laughed at the biker getting his head his you know <laughs> when he had his block knocked off, but when right. Mooney was the ventriloquist dummy, it went a little scarier, didn't it? It did. That was really cool. I love that when he the, the the sound effect of when he goes. Yeah, that did it. It was just little things effect. like that. All right, uh, so we're gonna go. We're gonna watch. You just you just brought up the uh, the clip about. Um, sorry about the knocking the block off. So we're gonna put that on right now for our viewers and there's something I noticed in this scene when I was rewatching the film that I wanted to ask you about um, we won't be able to see it on the video itself but um, I noticed it I noticed it and I want to I want to see what it was mean bike you got there can I take a ride pal can I beep the horn? <laughs> oh, oh, thank you! <laughs> you should have let the man ride his bike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I seem to have broken your bike. <laughs> Where'd it go? I love the, that you can kind of hear what they're saying a little bit, but it's really muffled and kind of garbled. But well, that was Chuck Serino. <laughs> we, they got, it, we made a clown language. Oh, that's great. Let's talk about that after the clip is finished. <laughs> I guess his head knocked off and we're laughing. I love it. You know, what what makes it, you know, the thing about that sequence is his bike, Tiny's bike was beautifully uh, constructed, with beautiful detail, and we never took a beauty shot of it. And I'm, I, I, I always regret that, that we didn't get a full lit beauty shot of it. We only see it getting smashed and destroyed. Right, right, right. Um, there is one thing in that scene that I noticed when re-watching the film today, and I saw some fishing wire. Some and I'm not no. sure. I did. I saw some no, fishing line. I did. I saw no, it. No, you didn't. 
and I want to know what that was for. I'm just, I'm really I really got to know because I feel like I'm the only the person who's who's. Oh, it was to hold the body up after the head was decapitated because we wanted it there shuddering before it flopped. Gotcha. We did ten takes to get the body. There were ten takes to get that body to fall right. That's awesome. Without looking stupid. I, I should have thought of that, but no, that t makes total sense. But I saw it. I want you to know I saw it, and I don't know if anybody else has ever seen it before, but I'm, I had to bring it up. Uh, that's, that's, did you guys know it was there? Did you guys know you could still see it? Yeah. I've never yeah, seen today it. We were just paint, today we would just paint it out digitally, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, today it's easy. You do that every second, you know, paint out exactly green guys and there are, wires and there. Are, there are a bunch of little gaps in the movie. You know, when uh, Farmer Green goes into his house at the beginning of the movie, gets Pooh Bear. He goes into his house to get his shovel and bucket. You see our prop master handing him the shovel and bucket. <laughs> That's great. I never I noticed. Notice that. Yeah. I never noticed yeah, that. Yeah, Farmer Green had a little something going on. <laughs> oh, yeah, it wasn't Mrs. Green. <laughs> That's great. Um, That's hilarious. There's yeah. there's another goof that I found today that I don't know if anybody has ever noticed before. I mean, somebody had to, have, but it's anybody. it's 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 at the very end when Mike and Debbie are in in uh, the blonde cop. I can't remember his name. Um, are running away. Hey. They're running away. And they stop to look back at the giant uh, clownzilla, um, and there's these little zigzags on the ground, like little shapes, different colored shapes on the ground. And they're they're not actually attached to the ground. I think they're just like uh, cardboard or something, and they slip on one and it moves. <laughs> they were supposed to be, but the sticky tape didn't didn't <laughs> didn't stick on that one. <laughs> Yeah, they were they allowed us to move them around and change the thing. I mean, right. remember, I don't know if you remember this, Grant. The first night we shot in that thing, we had black visqueen down in, on the floor, and it was slippery, and everybody kept on falling and slipping. And then so we had, we swapped it out for um, a, a, a proper a dance. dance floor. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Um, definitely had to bring that up. Um, yeah, I remember – do you remember slipping on that on that piece during that take? Do you remember that? You mean slipping? No, I don't. Uh, I don't remember that. I remember. I remember the black floor and how slippery it was. Right. Um, I think actually but somebody I don't remember, did remember slip uh, slipping on that particular. He could take his chance. Yeah. What's that? I think somebody did actually slip and fall, and we realized. We, it was just too dangerous. We couldn't risk anybody getting hurt. Yeah, that's an insurance liability for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so the thing about this movie, it all takes place over one night. Now, anybody who's worked on films uh, knows that that ends up being you're going to be working on a movie, shooting overnight for at least a month, um, and even though all the scenes aren't outside, um, you know, I, I'm sure some of them were shot in a studio lot. Um, but how was it shooting <laughs> all outside all the all nights uh, on that? Because those that's rough. I can tell you, night shoots are rough. We did it was 36 a... days, and they were all at night, even the ones that were shot on stage. Charlie could tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, what we were doing is we were building the sets, and um, I think it was because um, we had to uh, the 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 paint wouldn't dry. <laughs> yeah, the paint. Yeah, that was the issue. The the, the paint wouldn't dry, so the uh, we had to have the sets built and painted in the daytime so they could dry, so we could shoot them at night. Yeah, so, so after necessity. four weeks of being, four weeks of being outside at night, where everybody on the company was just for the all the reasons you said. Every, the company was just couldn't wait to get onto the warehouse that we were turning into our stages, so we could move the company into days. But right. that would mean that meant the art department had to work at night, and when they worked at night, literally the paint would not dry. So we made the decision to keep the company on nights. So art department could work during the day. 
because it was an unheated warehouse. It's like a hundred square, hundred thousand square foot warehouse in Santa uh, Santa Cruz. Um, okay. And there was no heat. It was wow. just a raw, empty space. And that just again, we did we did six weeks, six day weeks, up in up in Santa Cruz. We shot the movie in thirty six days. Six day weeks are tough. I can tell you that much, man. That's, whew. So props yeah, to we you. Know what's good about it? Well, the the beach, even though our condos are right there. <laughs> no, the the great thing about it was the 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 cast and the crew were all on board. I believe that everyone was so excited about the project that they had no problem with the hours and the time. Our problem was with the production, you know, with Transworld. They were complaining, all right, we can't be working these people hard. We can't now, we don't have time. We can't do that right. shot again. And we would say, no, no, you know, everybody wants to do it. So those were the battles. Right. People wanted to continue. We wanted to get this thing done. And uh, we were fighting with the, the front office. I mean, that makes sense. They're trying to save money. You guys are trying to, you know, get the best yeah. product you can you can get. Um, Grant? Well, they didn't really, they didn't oh, really know what we were doing. You know, they <laughs> yeah. thought we were just having guys in and clown makeup running around killing people. <laughs> they didn't realize. I mean, the 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 technicals of the clown masks I hear were not were very rudimentary. They weren't like crazy technical. It was a lot of fishing. It was fishing wire and latex foam, from what I understand. Um, I don't know if they were fully animatronic. Can you can you tell me? Can you guys tell me a little about that? No, oh, at, at yeah, at the time uh, we had uh, come off of. Um you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, watching others, you know, other people doing, you know, state of the art animatronics and stuff. So we were in that, in that mode. Uh, the Dwight Roberts and the people that we worked with um, actually made some very, um, you know, well, compared to what's done now, primitive. But we had servos in the heads, eye blinks, and uh, expression changes on the mouth. Um, the walk around the, the 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 walk around suits, you know, for the there was a mechanical head for close up and expressions that had the full bells and whistles, and uh, and the walk around suits had simple eye blinks. But um, you know, we we had uh, animatronic heads that were fairly sophisticated for the time. Oh wow, that's yeah, that's I mean, interesting. They were, they were cable controlled uh, for the most part, yeah. except the walk arounds had radio control blinks. So we had done critters before this, so. As far as like sophisticated animatronics, we were we were right up there with uh, you know some of the best people in town. That's awesome. See, I I figured that I I had heard that they were it was a lot of fishing line and the latex foam, but it's you know awesome to hear that it's uh, was actually animatronic. I mean, the, you guys are geniuses. You would have figured out a way to do it with just fishing line well, anyway. I, I, <laughs> just uh, I, mean, I, I I believe there was kind of both, right? Because you had your you had your kind of hero heads that had the all the animal Cables. servos in it, and then you but then you have a similar as the same head during it that of course didn't have. Is that right? Wasn't there wasn't there like the hero head that would be kind of if I recall correctly? But you, we didn't have all. You the know what I'm remembering as, as Edward said. Yeah, you know it's only it's only been thirty years, and I <laughs> I don't know I don't know who I am. Um, but uh, yeah, the the close-up heads with the expression were cable controlled. Awesome. They, they were cable controlled. The the servo, the the remote controls were the blinks on the walkarounds, you know, on the full body ones. My, I, I've got a I've got another film insider question. Did did you guys have film five dollar Fridays on on movie sets back then? Do you guys know five dollar Fridays? Yeah. No. Yeah, we did. You did yeah. back then. You know, oh, you mean when you go around with the hat and everybody puts in like the money, you write the money you write your name on it. Yeah, we did that. Okay, that's awesome. I didn't know like how long that had been around back when I you know that's that's great to well, know that that's was a thing. It was so long ago that we were watching. We were shooting on film. We didn't have video assist. You know, the director, my brother Stephen, had to rely. That this is the shot that I want, and when the shot was taken, Stephen would watch the performance and he'd ask the DP or the assistant DP, "Did you get it?" And they right. said, "Yeah, we got it." 
We waited two days for the dailies because we had to send back to Hollywood. And then we got to the dailies, and he didn't get it. It's out of focus. Out of yeah, focus. I mean, a, out of out of frame. Yeah. Oh, that's a nightmare. That's a nightmare, man. I what we always say is name Rob Rob Amato. Is that right? No, uh, Alfred Taylor was our DP. Al Taylor. Alfred yeah. Taylor. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the shots were great, you know, they, they, they were fine, but some really important ones, you know, that the camera was just, the, 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 the angle was off, and, you know, it would have been nice to see it on video, because then you know you got it. Right. Well, so that, so that kind of gets us into what were some of the challenges of the film, besides, you know, working it all night, uh, having to shoot on film and wait two days for dailies to see if you got to go back and reshoot an entire scene. Uh, what were some of the other challenges that you guys had uh, back then on a film like this? I mean, you know, it, it had the $2 million budget, but I would still consider that an independent film, uh, even for the time. Well, given, given our end of it, the special effects got, you know, a decent budget, but certainly not the, uh, it was the location shooting and, 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 the, uh, and, and, and those other costs, uh, putting people up and, you know, and, and, and traveling up to Santa Cruz and locations that probably took the lion's share, editing and all of that. But our effects budget and set budgets were, you know, uh, uh, moderate. Right, Edward? You, you had the figures. Yeah, I mean, tra transportation got, had more money than, than we spent on clowns <laughs> and, and sets. Yeah. I mean, our, our whole art department budget was like $80,000. The clown heads cost $25,000. That's eight you know, clowns. Tennessee do. Gene, uh, Gene Warren Jr. Leslie Huntley did the uh, visual effects for eighty thousand dollars. But that was uh, that was where we came from. So it was very easy for us to call. Not easy, but we knew a lot of people that just with a lot of goodwill and did did real solids for us and and helped us make that movie. Mark Sullivan, you know, did all the matte paintings. You know, he's legendary. He's just top and, notch. Uh, wasn't that also kind of the? Um, what, that was also kind of. Part of the, I think, the attraction of the finance, this trans world, and everything was, oh, we'll we'll get these guys to make a five million dollar movie for two million dollars. Right? <laughs> exactly. It's well, funny. I got yelled at. The, yes. the only time Moshe yeah. Diamant called me during production was to yell at me uh, because yeah. uh, we had done an we had done an interview with uh, it was Fangoria or Starlog, one of the the fan, you know, horror fan magazines at the time, and I think I I said the budget that you know we were doing the effects for a, a hundred thousand dollars, and he called and he called and yelled, you know, rightfully so. I should have never have mentioned the budget, but he's you know he says, oh, you can't do that. You can't talk about the budget. I'm telling people that we're spending a million dollars on the effect, and I said, Moshe, I said, I'm sorry, you're right. I shouldn't have mentioned the budget, but I said I will never. Say we're spending a million dollars on the effect. <laughs> I I would just avoid the question because we're not, you know. Uh, I mean, yeah. you, you got a million dollars worth of effect, but you didn't pay it. Yep, yep. That, <laughs> well, he's that, trying to the whole the whole thing is he wanted you to stick ten pounds in the in the two pound bag, but he wanted yeah. to sell it as a ten pound bag. So yeah, yeah. We don't. Yeah, we, we were. It was our first movie. We were, we were really green. So we learned, right. I learned so much, not only about the mechanics of making movies, the just politics. The, the politics. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it was funny, Charlie mentioned, you know, uh, there was one, uh, there was one scene, um, the, it's, it's, it's a famous scene too, all the clowns getting out of the clown car. Right. <laughs> well, we've been setting that up all night and um, we set it up in the loading dock of the warehouse. We, we built a false floor covering the loading dock that we put the, the car on top of so the clowns could come up from underneath the floor and come out of the car. We'd been setting that up all night and the sun was rising because it was out in the loading dock. That was one of the things we kind of did. It was outside but you know in the, in the loading dock area and our AD uh, was ready to pull the plug on us. No, we're, you know, we've been here too long. We've been here all night. We got to stop everybody's beat. So I went around and I talked to all the department heads and key members of the crew and they said, hey, you know, we busted our ass to get this ready. How long is it going to take? The setup is going to take the time. We'll be able to shoot this in 20 minutes, a half hour. Let's let's do it. We're all for it. 
and um, the AD and I actually got into a, a physical uh, altercation. Steven, the director of the movie, had to jump in between us to separate <laughs> us because he, he was going to pull a plug. And I said, no, we're the producers. We're, we're doing this. The crew is behind us. And we, we got our way. We shot it. That's and awesome. by the way, yeah, don't, I, mess that, that don't mess with the Kyoto. Don't mess with the Kyoto scene in the movie. I, we, I mean, by the way, that everybody in the on the set loved that scene because, you know, when all those pies fly um, at the security guard. First of all, <laughs> that was everybody on the set that wasn't holding a, a boom or a camera. We all had a thing, so we all got to throw a pie, and. We just thought it was the most fun scene, and then of course, I, the guy who was just like a local hire guy to me, killed the line reading. I mean, oh. I just can't imagine a better line reading than, yeah. what are you gonna do with those pies, boys? <laughs> I mean, he just nailed it. That was it, David, right? uh, that was Dave what? His, um, David Peel. David Peel, yeah. yeah. Now, he was great, here's the story. he was perfect. <laughs> Yeah, here's what? the story. The pie scene in Killer Clowns from Outer Space. The Kyoto brothers grew up with the king of pie throwers, Soupy Sales. I said, I want Soupy Sales to get hit with the pies. We called Soupy. He was going to do it one night for $10,000. Oh my gosh. Anyone who knows Soupy Sales knows that that would have been the casting coup for that part. Oh, absolutely. They didn't want to spring for it because Moshe Diamon didn't know who Soupy Sales was. He didn't yeah. get irrelevant. Yeah, the, the, the audience wouldn't know who Soupy Sales was, so it you know it was a waste of money. Wow. Yeah, but Soupy Sales was supposed to be the security guard, but David Peel did a great job. He That's did. Awesome. He did a, just a, a great job. I mean, I, you know, obviously Soupy Sales is something else, but I can't imagine it being done much better. You know, with you oh, know, no. Soupy Sales would be Soupy Sales. It would be a gag, a different kind of gag. But he yeah. just that was the he just nailed And it. the other thing is, other the other thing is when you put a, a celebrity cameo in, you take the audience out of. The reality that you're creating, so that's yeah. the better reason. I don't know. It worked pretty well for Tim Burton and Beetlejuice and Dick Cavett. And <laughs> Robert well, <laughs> you know that that worked because of the type of movie it was too. So I guess we could have gotten away with it. You're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> we'll have uh, to go back digitally and replace him. <laughs> no, no, George Did Lucas. Yeah. Don't, don't George That's Lucas. Right. Don't George Lucas the film. Leave all the strings in and and the in in the goose. Leave, I love it the way it is. Please. Yeah, but but Grant, it's interesting. You know, you know. I guess maybe I I don't remember if we consulted the actors when we decided to to go to all night. So that was pretty grueling. You were in just about every freaking shot. <laughs> I mean, you know, listen. Um, I, I imagine you know if you're an actor and you're into it. You show up and you're there till it's done. You, all you care about is wanting it to be good. You know, you might have a. I mean, you have agents and people that complain about stuff, but I, I don't think I've ever complained about working too long in my life. And I certainly wasn't on Killer Clowns, right? I was just happy to be there. You just want it <laughs> to be good. Totally. Um... So, I want to get into like the really good stuff, uh, which I like to call. I call them set stories, stories from the set. Uh, those little memories that you make on these little uh, camp-like things we call feature films. Um, uh, like there was one time I was working on a film with uh, Eva Longoria. It was a comedy, um, and I was a key set PA. And it was before the day it was getting started. The sun was just coming up, and. Uh, I see this guy running by, and all of a sudden, I hear just this really bo loud, booming voice go, uh, is Eva Longoria on set today? And I'm like, oh my god, like, what is that? And I look up, and it's Michael Clark, Michael Clark Duncan with, like, a 80-pound weight vest on, running with a German shepherd. And I'm like, oh my god, and he goes, tell Eva Longoria, Michael Clark D Duncan, say hello. 
And it's just like <laughs> one of those weird moments like that you only that only happens to you when you're working on a film set in LA. So, um, do you guys have anything fun like that that happened happened to you when you were like making the film, like uh, anything like that you could think of? I had no fun. <laughs> <laughs> Producers usually I don't. Kind of, I, I had kind of a, a, well, you know, it's not like a Hollywood type of story, but it is in a way, but it was like terrible for me at the time, but now I laugh about it. So the story was, is that um, my, uh, I became really good buddies with this guy. He later passed away, but he was, you know, he was like a, worked in the prop department. He was a great big just yeah. hilarious guy named Mark Borofsky. And um oh, Mark. And Mark Borofsky, you know, be, you know, he became like my buddy on the set and and as a matter of fact, like it was too long I had an apartment with an extra bedroom, so at the end of the night we would go back and play Pong, if you can believe it. <laughs> at, you know, whatever <laughs> time it was, six o'clock in the morning for an hour and then so he wouldn't have to he was local hire, so he wouldn't have to drive back. He would he would, uh, you know, uh, crash at my my condo, and uh, the guy he was just he was just a jokester. He was a big personality, funny guy. And the first time he met me, he couldn't he couldn't say he, he said my name wrong. He called me Graham <laughs> instead of Grant, <laughs> and and I would correct him and say and say no, it's Grant. And he would you know he's just the kind of guy that would say gotcha, Graham. <laughs> right? And then from then on out, like that was his name for me was Graham. He just decided to call me Graham instead of Grant. Oh, that's great. So <laughs> this is like, a, so I don't know if even you guys remember this, but maybe you've heard me tell the story once or twice before. But um, so one day, oh, so one day I had I had eaten something bad, and I was having to run to the bathroom quite a bit. <laughs> And and uh, I went to Stephen, our director, you know, because you don't want to like telegraph these things loudly to everybody, you know, that you've got the runs, right? Ten one hundred. Ten one hundred. Stephen, from time to time, I'm going to kind of just go dashing toward my dressing room, and uh, I, you know, I am just going to run. Just know that when that happens. Like, it's an emergency, and I'll be back as fast as I can. So he's like, oh, God, no worries, no worries, I got you. <laughs> well, we didn't go and announce it to everybody else because it was nobody's business, right? Um, you know, the director knew, I knew, I think, you know, probably Charlie and Ed knew, and that's who needed to know. Right. Well, meanwhile, this obnoxious AD, I think his name was Todd or something like that. Oh, God, Todd. Um, Todd the of our uh, production manager. Yeah. Todd that? Foreman was our second. Fred Wardell was our the first. Second, our Todd second Foreman. AD. Yeah. So Rogers' he nephew. Me, he, okay, he's what? Rogers' nephew. Oh, Rogers' nephew. Okay, well, he sees right. me running to the to the bathroom, and then he sees he's running to my dressing room in the middle of working, and then and then he uh, he hears. Mark Borofsky calling me Graham and he starts putting together a great little conspiracy story. So one day I get called into an office and the casting director is on the phone and my agent is on the phone and there's kind of like a an intervention going on, right? And I'm like, what's what's happening here? Everybody's like, well, we're here to talk about your cocaine problem. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't snort cocaine. I don't have a cocaine problem. Come on, Grant. You come to And now the evidence starts to come out. And Todd is there and he says, well, come, you know, the, the evidence is all came from this guy, Todd. And, he, and it's like, it's so bad that he's leaving right in the middle of scenes and running to his dressing room to do cocaine. And it's so bad that people on the set have even taken to calling him Graham oh, as a nickname. Oh my God! And I'm like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" And I'm like, "Now I'm trying to, con you know, once these things get down the line, too, they think you're lying, right?" And I'm going, well, "No." It's funny. 
I was sick to my stomach. I had a problem. And he called me that because it was a joke. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, from from our catering. I became like the cocaine <laughs> that never that, did that cocaine. Did come, <laughs> that did come through me. I get a call one day from our executive production manager telling me how production saved your ass from getting arrested <laughs> because of that incident. I said, what are you talking about? He had the squirts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is that against the law? Yeah, I had the squirts. It's like, oh my God. I mean, this somehow, I mean, remember that the, the casting director that we had, I mean, everybody was on the line, right? And it was like, and it was this big thing, and you're trying to, to to defend yourself on something with all this kind of empirical evidence pulled out of contest, contest that had nothing to do with reality. Oh, that's fantastic. That's, no, that, that, that's, that's one of those things. You know, yeah, you, you're hiring professionals, and you expect them to operate professionally. I, I, I remember <laughs> um, our continuity girl yeah, uh, um, was- taking uh, photographs, continuity photographs of our elaborate setups so that we could match them, you know, from cut to cut, scene to scene. And we found out um, that uh, uh, she had an Instamatic camera and was sending it to a photo photo lab and was getting the pictures back the next day instead of a Polaroid camera. <laughs> which so we have the continuity and, and, photographs instantly. Yeah, that it might was, be... Kind of a big deal to have them on set while you're actually shooting. Instead yeah, it was, of the it was next kind of hard to do continuity. It was kind, you kind, can't kind, kind of sad. <laughs> kind, kind of sad. Kind of funny. It was her first. She'd done like little kind of small movies. This is her first big break. She was really sweet. Um, but yeah. it's funny. So yeah, after that, she was just. She was just. She just couldn't do it. She couldn't step up and handle the job of a feature film with as many moving parts as we had. So I, you know, the decision was made that I, I had I had to fire her. But uh, so we we had actually sourced one, got one, hired one, but we couldn't we couldn't fire her until the other the new scripty came up onto set. So when she got there um, at wrap, I was going to let her know that she was we were letting her go. Uh, but she was super efficient, man. She went and got the call sheet for the next day, and. The AD, instead of I told him what I was gonna do, he gave her the call sheet, and she found out she was not oh on the God. call sheet. Anymore. Oh come on! Yeah, and then come she on. she left. When I went up to talk to her, she was in tears, and she just left that the poor set girl. with all the first week of continuity <laughs> continuity notes. Oh no! Um, and then I had to go. I had to go to the hotel the next day and go and apologize because I, I that's not how I do it. You know, I, I don't treat sure. people like that. Right. Um, and you know, so the first thing I went up, I went up to her and said, "You're not going to shoot me, are you?" Because I heard she had a gun. Um, <laughs> you know, I explained, and I apologized, and I got, a, I got the a, notes and everything. A cocoon gun, you were okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, that's. I mean, it's that's a terrible story. I, ha- I hate hearing about uh, people, you know, having to get fired from sets and stuff. Sometimes you just have to do it because it's you, you yeah. got to have the right person for the job. Sometimes it's even can be a personality thing. Some some people just don't jive well, right with other people on set. And you can understand you know, she was, that. She was great. She got along with everybody. She got along especially well with the Terenzi brothers. Exceptionally well. Oh, uh, I don't but, I, uh, I don't want to know how well, I don't want to know how well that do we? But but there is um you know there's the thing where the political firings are the things, you know, I won't go into detail, but there were political firings that got rid of some people that we wanted to work with in lieu of others. So it was that kind of a thing. And I didn't, we didn't appreciate that, but, right, you know, it right. all worked out in the end, but it put us in, put us in awkward positions. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but you ended up making one of the biggest cult classics of all time. Let's be honest, guys. I don't know many people who haven't heard of Killer Clowns from Outer Space and, and the iconic theme song. Uh, speaking of... That, that whole Dickie thing, that was a whole nother thing. That was uh, a godsend. Didn't they write that song before they actually saw the film? Is yeah, that true? Yeah, Bob Hunka, our music supervisor. In fact, I, funny, I just came across the letter. Uh, I was going through some old files. Uh, helping out a friend who's going to be doing some fu- something real fun with the the projects uh, in the next couple of months, and I found the letter that uh, Bob Hunker wrote to Enigma Records um, 
of uh, you know the, the Dickie's label, and it, it, it's it's his little pitch about what the what the movie's about, and and based on that, um, you know uh, Leonard Phillips uh, wrote Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and he nailed it. Oh, I think it's fantastic! He did a great Absolutely. job. Absolutely, it's so catchy. It sticks in your head for sure. Yeah, you know the amazing thing about the the cast in in, in Killer Clowns was. Um, which I I thought was a testament to their 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 skills was that you had to play it straight because you know anyone could have smirked at the camera and made fun of a thing called Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Steven's direction was this is dead serious. It doesn't matter that they're clowns; they're killing people, and you have to convince them. Right. And the testimony to Grant and Suzanne was that they kept it seriously. They didn't make it a joke. Well, right. I mean, it, it, it was, we actually really had to trust Stephen because it was dead serious, but it was heightened serious. You know yeah. what I mean? He wanted it to, to be, you know, to be that, like never to wink at the, ca at the camera or anything like that, but, but to be a little over the top with the seriousness. You know what I mean? He wanted it to be almost like those old those old fifties, you know, the know, blob Godzilla movies or something, right? Yes. Yeah, the yeah, movies we grew up with. You had to kind of trust it because as an actor you feel like you're going up a little bit too high, you know what I mean? Right. Like, right. like oh my god, they're killing people. Yeah. But you just had to trust. You go, no, that was perfect. That so you go, okay, I'm trusting you, Steven. <laughs> and it worked one hundred percent. He was a hundred percent right on that. He knew what uh, he wanted. You know, you got to trust your director. Um, I mean, you you know, you got to go all in. You know what I mean? If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. For, fortunately, it worked. But you have to trust the director, and uh, um, you're coming on board to somebody else's vision, and you're trying to bring whatever you can to it. But at the end of the day, you're fitting into. There's they're looking at the whole piece, you know what I mean? Right, the whole right. Yeah, so, Grant's, so the whole puzzle. Grant scene, Grant scene. You know when he takes him out to show where the tent was, and the tent is not there, but right there's there. a giant crater in the ground, and and Grant is trying to convince that you know. I came out here to show you the thing, but my proof is gone. Yeah. <laughs> the tent is gone, but Dave, the cop, didn't say, what the hell is that hole? Right, right. <laughs> but Grant, but, he but just Grant said, I'm tired of your that. shit, like, man. My proof is gone. <laughs> so I'm tired of your <laughs> bullshit, man. That's your, that's your best scene in the movie, I think. You know, personally, I think it's it's where you and – there was real tension between you guys there. There was. <laughs> <laughs> there was. Well, there I was. mean, the funny part of it was is he was kind of in love with 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 Suzanne, you know, and uh, so I didn't have real tension with him, but he had real tension with me from like before the movie started, you know. He was always oh. he was always kind of really being Dave with me, you know what I mean? Like acting like he was kind of like like the older big brother figure who, you know, you stay away from my girl, <laughs> like. So was that, was he just, was he being, um, what do you call it, uh, was he, uh... Was he being a method actor? Yeah, was he method, or was that actually a little bit yeah. real? Well, that yeah, was his know, character, because both. Dave had dated <laughs> Debbie before, so he was a jealous ex-boyfriend. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, he was a double, double do-right, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so totally. Grant, I got a question for you. Were there any moments when during the filming where Steven is maybe giving you some direction or maybe like you're reading like a rewrite of the script of the scenes, you're reading the sides for their day and you're like, this is bullshit. I, like this guy's, these guys are crazy. They don't, you know what I mean? Like what, what are they doing? Did you no, ever have a moment like way, that? I mean, like I would say about a fourth of the lines were suggestions of mine, you know what I mean? Like. <laughs> He was very open to like, hey, what if I said this? Like, as long as you weren't changing what he wanted to happen, I don't think Stephen was ever like, you know, I mean, he wanted, he, you know what I mean? If you said, how about if I say this instead and you're getting the same meaning across, he was totally cool with that. Right. I mean, right. We, we, we were all, we, we sat and we rehearsed. We got up there, we got up there a week early and we sat around a table and, and um, it was very, in terms of the dialogue, it was very, um, you know, he was very flexible and very willing to, to listen to all of our input. 
Yeah, I, I didn't mean that in a bad way. I think I meant it more like yeah, no, it's it's just second guessing yourself, way. like just second guessing yourself. You know what I mean? More more of that type of thing. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to. Oh, no, 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 totally. I mean, we didn't ever. We, I mean, we just totally trusted everything when it came to um, when it came to uh, you know how we should play it and what we were doing. But as far as like the dialogue, he was very open to our suggestions. We would say. And that doesn't quite, you know, because you know, sometimes don't know until you get the actors in a room and you start bouncing lines. You know, something works on the page, but it doesn't really right. work. And you know, so we would say, "How about this instead?" And he was he was very cool about it. Yeah, I, I think, think in, in our ever had a. Yeah, I think in our original script, we just again we we was very wordy in our in the script. So again, the actors just brought life to it, brevity. You know, mm-hmm. more in the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well there was a, my favorite line in the film was delivered by uh, Dave when they were, you know, when they were rescuing Debbie and they were going to flee the cocoon room, and the cocoon room was filled with thousands of cocoons. And he says, "We can't leave now. There still might be." People alive in these cocoons. And people right. say that's the dumbest line ever. But the way it was delivered, that's a very serious and poignant line. He was concerned. He was a Dudley Do Right hero. He was sure. concerned for the, the thousands of people that the clowns had imprisoned in cocoons and balloons. Who? Let's oh, the we have who, the that we have to we, that we have to add. Those people all got blown up at the end of the film. Those people all died. Like, Our body count is tremendous, right? I don't think a lot of people realize that. It's like it's it's like Empire. It's it's like Star Wars. Like the thing got it got blown up, and they're all dead. So that town's in for some hurt. Even though there's a happy ending for our three main characters uh, or five main characters, really. Um, yeah, everybody else is dead. So yeah, what's, yeah. It, they, they it's were not coming the back. They're not coming back. No, no, no. <laughs> but you're thinking. You know the, the the ones that were alive in the balloons. That's they knew what was going uh, on, right? They were like that's conscious. The darkness. Yeah, that's the darkness. Yeah, killer clown. Yeah. So, is could that play into a possible sequel? Could that be a storyline? A town that's so that got destroyed by all this major loss or something like that. Let's let's talk about the sequel because I know I think a lot of people are waiting to hear about that. Um, What's well, going on with Killer Clowns? Well, there is no, there is no sequel, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have ideas and ambitions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been pitching, we've been pitching Killer Clowns the sequel. You know, right? You know, the the, the day after we finished filming, um, we had in 1989 Chris Beard, the creator of the uh, the Gong Show, Sonny and Cher, uh, Donnie and Marie. He, he got a deal with Viacom to do Killer Clowns the series. We oh, wow. We Transworld. The deal, we had the deal. They were going to pay us $25,000 to option it, to develop it, $250,000 to option. So the deal went away. We had Killer Clowns from Outer Space, the TV series with Chris Beard in 1989. And Transworld squashed it. That's that sucks. I didn't. Hey, I had never heard that. Yes, sir. Um, I just really apologize, but um, I've got another commitment, uh, and I have to check out. Um, anytime else you need me, you've got me back. But uh, these guys um, are, are, as you know, as you can see, they've got a, a wealth of great stuff. Oh well, I appreciate it for coming on, Grant. Uh, like it's this is a dream of mine, having been a fan for so long. Um, and thank you for giving your time to us and sharing that uh, great story about uh, Graham. And uh, <laughs> that was classic. That'll probably make it onto a special edition DVD at, at some point. I think on down the line, hopefully at some uh, but, point. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, good but, seeing you again, Grant. I like the haircut. Hey, it's a called the well, non haircut. It's called it's the, the, the non haircut. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, oh, thank you. I have COVID haircut, but I'm, getting, I'm half vaccinated, so maybe pretty soon I'll get it uh, cut up, and maybe I'll leave it for a little while. <laughs> oh, oh, Grant, I, I remember I told you to bring one of your local beers. We didn't get to get to oh. the beers, but oh, it's okay. Yeah, but sorry. but here here's my local beer. It's uh, Fireman's Four from Austin, Texas. If you can ever oh, find sweet. it, it's a uh, great beer. Um, I love it. So, cheers, cheers Next to time. you, Grant. Cheers to you, Grant. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Hey, Grant. Hey, hopefully, we'll see you soon. Edward. We tried to get in on the Austin thing. It just it good good didn't happen. Ah. Uh, well, but, we'll uh, miss you as always, but we'll hopefully we'll get a few this year before it's out. Yeah, it would be fun to be in Austin with you guys. I love I love that city. Oh, I, you know I'm based in Austin, right? The, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'll see you later, guys. Yeah, I'm an Austin. Right, be well. uh, Take care, Grant. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm based. I'm based uh, in Austin, Texas. Well, do oh, you know? Cool. Do you know that yeah, they're yeah, going to be down there, Grant, Suzanne? No. You know Harold and Mike. Yeah, um, yeah Harold and Father, Mike. Well, uh, Father's Day weekend. No, I had no idea. Yeah, uh, it's a mini cult classic uh, con. That's great. When? When? It, well, what weekend is that? That's in May. Uh, June eighteenth. June eighteenth. June eighteenth. Well, that's yeah, yeah. awesome. Maybe we, that's awesome. I, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, hopefully, I'm not like working on a TV show or anything, so uh, I could uh, yeah, maybe yeah. come come check that out. Um, yeah, we've done a couple of Alamo draft houses in uh, yeah? in Alamo in uh, Austin. I've always I've always enjoyed it. And we did a a, a, a little seminar at the, the college. Sure, at UT UT Film School. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's great. Um, well, hopefully I'll see you guys. If you guys are you guys coming down too in June or is no, it no, just not for that. It's a, a smaller show. So okay, actually we're gonna be in we're gonna be in Pennsylvania at the Mahoning Driving that weekend doing the, the Critters. Uh, oh, feature. oh, well, yes. Well, I got you guys here. Can we talk a little bit about Critters because that's sure. uh, one of my favorite uh, series of all time. I watched that religiously as a kid. In fact, I loved it so much. I want to show this to you guys. Um, I actually did this. I didn't even know um, what was going to be going on here. Let me see. Okay, so I'm going to put you on my... Uh, here we go. Desktop. One second. Desktop. Triple. All right. Um, and I want to show you my preview. Here we go. This is a drawing I did of a critter a few months ago. I know I'm a terrible artist. I'm, I'm really, really, really bad. But I figured, I was like, oh my god, these guys are going to be on the show. I got to pull up my iPad uh, drawing of a critter to show them that I really am a super fan of the films. Uh, so yeah, don't laugh. I know it's bad, but um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's that's my critter oh, drawing. It's uh, it's uh, it, it, it's a cool it's a cool drawing. You captured it. You captured it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I mean, I just, I just that 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 film series is kind of like Killer Clowns in the fact that it's kind of campy and fun, but also really scary at the same time. This basically the same same tone. Uh, and is it D Wallace? Is she the is D Wallace the mother in that? D Wallace is the, the first D one, Wallace yeah. is the uh, the mom. The mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've seen them all. Even the one with Mrs. Leo. Brown. Yeah, I've I've seen them all. Even Critters in Space, that's Critters Part 4, I believe. Four, Critter, yeah. And Critters 3 is with Leonardo DiCaprio, one of his yeah. first Mrs. film roles, um which is awesome. Uh so kudos to you guys for uh that series. Um just yeah, I watch them all the time. I, I own them all. So, um, any anything you want to talk about uh, when it comes to really the critters? I know you guys made the, did the TV show, right? Was that was it at the? No, we it? didn't actually. We talked. We were we were in conversations with them about doing um, the new binge. Mm -hmm. um, but then when it um, when they decided they were going to shoot it in Canada, um, it just didn't make sense for us economically. Right. Um, the money they would have pay, had to pay us and bring a crew up to Canada would have been taking too much money away from the critters being on screen. So uh, we had our run. You know, we did one through four. Time to turn over the mantle to somebody else. Sure, there wasn't enough yeah. wasn't enough money in it for us to do what 
we what we would want to do with critters, you know, all this right. time later. Right. What did, and, what did you, what did you... Guys, you know, the guys gave us, uh, you know, they were um, uh, zombievers. And that zombievers is a really funny, you know, homage to uh, to crazy horror films. It had in the same in the same vein as a killer clown. So they had the chops for it. And we would have I would have loved to have collaborated with them on it. But, uh, you know, they, they they went out on their own and we were confident that they were going to to do it. They they told us that if there wasn't killer clowns from outer space, there wouldn't have been a zombievers, which was a was a nice compliment. Right, I love Zombievers too. That, that that's a that's a yeah. that's a classic. Um, yeah. So yeah, so uh, yeah, but uh, you know, good critters. The first critters again always hold a, like a special place in my heart. It was a, it was the first uh, feature film we keyed the the main effects on. You know, it was uh, you know Kevin Yeager. They were talking to him right. originally, uh, but he was super busy with the Elm Street stuff, right? You know, the other things going on at New Line, and he recommended us. Right. And, uh, you know, Steve Herrick, uh, the director, uh, we went into a meeting. Charlie, we had read the script. Charlie had done some sketches, uh, you know, the night before and on the way over and uh, showed it to them and kind of nailed it. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get that God, that job. That's awesome, man. I, I, I can't say enough about it. Um, you guys have made so many movies that have literally touched, like, my childhood. Movies that I grew up on. Uh, and it's it's just fantastic. You, and you guys are geniuses when it uh, when it comes to the genre and to the work you do. Just you know, not only as special effects guys, but you know, as writers and stuff like that. So I just want to. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. We've been really fortunate. You know, uh, you know, we don't have maybe a, a long a list of some of the other companies, but when you look back, when I look back at it, you know, we've definitely had some iconic moments and some great movies. Large Marge and. He was Big Adventure, you know, Team America, World Police, the right. Critters movie. Right. You know, just even a, a, a 30 second, 45 second commercial in Robocop that kind of stand out as being different from what else is going on in the movie. Was that a stop, really was that a stop motion? That, that commercial in yeah. Robocop? It was a stop motion? Yeah, the, the 6, 000, yeah. SUX 6000. That's awesome. I didn't know that. So I learned something new today. That's amazing. Big is yeah. back. No, some, pe <laughs> some people don't know that. The uh, the Michael Jackson thriller video, we did the animated titles for the video and the making of. Oh, that's awesome! See, like there's so things many like little that. things. Yeah, yeah. There's that's that's amazing. I do have one question that was brought up to me by a friend of mine on Facebook, and I gotta get a definitive answer here for the internet. Were the clown masks used? In Ernest Scared Stupid. <laughs> no. They, they, they were really not. weren't. I think we might have used an ear mold. Because by the time we did uh, uh, Ernest, um, we had unfortunately, we had we'd moved our studio and we disposed of the original molds. Um, any similarities to the characters was my style basically interpreting the director, John Cherry's. John Cherry gave me beautiful drawings of what he wanted the troll army to look like and Trantor. I just am to men in suits so that we could do it. Because, you know, some of his proportions, the head was as big as the body, and that right. was a little cumbersome you right. know, on set. So I modified it that way. But they were inspired by John Cherry's uh, uh, drawings. And it just happens it's my style, you know, my style is killer clown, so it looks like it. And I use similar shapes. The clowns had, you know, triangular shapes and uh, and, and peanut shapes. I used the same variations that were in yeah. John's. He had the same variations in his, you know, big nose, you know. Right. Yeah, we we yeah, might so have had a junk casting of something that we used for one of the background characters, but in terms of, like, the main characters, they were, they were all original sculpts, you know, you know Andy Clements, uh, Cagle, Jim Cagle. Jim um, Rowland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. Well, there's your answer, Internet. The definitive answer from the guys who did it. Not reused masks from Killer Clowns. 
That's well, probably, what do we know? That Facebook will tell us otherwise. Right? No, they're going to say, nah, they're full of shit. Like, it was definitely the same mess. Like, just repurp. No. Nah. Because a lot of people were saying, like, oh, maybe it was due to budget constraints or something like that, that they reused some molds or something like that. So, you know, like Charlie no, said, we, had, budget... we, did, we did keep the ear molds and stuff. We did have those. So some of the ears uh, might have made it into uh, Ernest Scared Stupid. Yeah. The budget constraints. Um, we put we, we we put everything into Trantor, you know. Aaron Sims, you know, painted it. Um, you know, we had Bart uh, Barton Mixon and, and crew doing the suits. All of that stuff was amazing. You know, the body suits and stuff. The costumes were done by John Cherry's wardrobe. But um, you know, basically, uh, um, the, uh, the 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 work was all done. You know, by uh, uh, you know, by us and um, you know, by a group of the guys we've been working with for decades. Right, and that was done while we were doing Critters three and four. So Stephen and I stayed in in town in Los Angeles and did Critters three and four. And Charlie actually went to Tennessee to shoot Ernest. Yeah, the the, the problem was all the bells and whistles went into uh, um, Trantor, and they didn't have the budget to put bells and whistles in the troll army. They, I don't even think they had eye blinks. So they're just guys running around. Right. Um, to get any animation out of it, sometimes I took the head off, put my hand in it, and did this. Like you know, a boggling. Hand. Like a boggling. Yeah. You remember a boggling? Yeah, just to, get some, yeah. just to get some animation out of it. There was a close-up with Eartha Kitt where the... She comes out and sprays it with, with, with mace or something, and the head went out like this, and I opened the mouth. You know, yeah. it was a close-up. Things like that. But, you know, that that's the kind of stuff, unfortunately, that it would have been nice to have a little money to put some animatronics in some of the other suits. Sure. The characters yeah, were really, uh, really even Even Trantor, I, I, wasn't the original, Trantor's original name in the original script was Two Nosets, and there was a design yes. that Charlie had come where he actually has two noses, and yeah. it was really... Yeah. yeah, I actually saw that movie in the theaters. I remember. <laughs> I remember going to the theater to see that film. So yeah, don't... and that was a pleasure being down there. You know what? Down in Tennessee, we went into a warehouse. There was some locations, but everything in the in the forest and the treehouse was built in a warehouse on a set. They moved in tons of dirt and trees. And actually created it uh, so much so that after the the several weeks of filming, a month of filming, um, there was wildlife. There were raccoons and birds living in the forest <laughs> inside the warehouse. That's great. Uh, we got a question from the audience. My buddy Jeffrey Hall here. He says, uh, if for a sequel to, I'm assuming, uh, Killer Clowns would ever get greenlit, would you envision the clowns looking similar? To the originals, or uh, would you use an updated approach? It depends on if uh, people want to see the original clowns, because in the clown universe, anything is possible. So if they want to see the clowns that were killed, we could easily bring them back, because clowns can clone, except the clone is with a K, okay? You know? And uh, we could do that. But for the last 30 years, wow. I've been drawing clowns every day. I have a universe of clowns. Don't worry about what the clowns are going to look like. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of like technique, for us, you know, we would always love to make them practical. You know, so they would be physically there on set with us. That's not to say that we wouldn't use some digital enhancements and things like that. But you know, for, for, from our standpoint, you know, we'd always want to do practical clowns. You know, guys in costumes, puppet heads servos you got sort of to thing. you have to i'm gonna put that request yeah. in right now keep it yeah. old school but, man keep it old school but in response to that some of the designs that i had you're limited it's like the grinch and um and uh, the cat in the hat it's great that you get you know jim carrey in there and they did rick did an unbelievable makeup job on it but the proportions are not dr seuss's grinch some of the clowns I've been drawing have pencil necks and, you know, big heads and stuff and really odd proportions. All right. Okay. I would love to see, I would love to, 
the only way you could bring those to life would be you know digitally enhanced or puppets you know we can do rod puppets you know yeah, and you know and rod puppetry and or like you know heads on top of people you get rid of their head and create the pencil neck with digital yeah. technology it, it's possible yeah. but it's not possible at two million dollars now you know that's the thing you know exactly. a movie today would cost a little bit more uh, to do so and, that, and that's one of the reasons you know, we haven't seen yes. another clown. There, there are economic forces at work. You know, it's you know, it's really complicated. The film business. We were we were in the right place at the right time off for the original. Um, you know, uh, you know, it happened to be in the boom of the video market. You know, home video. Um, so there was just an explosion. Like this need for content that we were in the right place at the right time. Actually, we're in a similar place right now with the streamers. Um, but you know, clowns and in its original release didn't make money. It made like forty two thousand dollars in the box office during its initial run, which right. is zero. And that's why zero. I'm having a hard time. no foreign. I mean I, funny, I just happened to I just I looked at it uh, 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 as an old statement. And it made like two hundred and forty thousand dollars box office worldwide. That's which crazy. is nothing. Nobody's gonna green light a sequel based on that. Huh? You know, the fact that it's 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 beloved after thirty five years. Um, that's great, but studios want to make their money back in six months, not I, 30 years. I'll tell you right now, I think it's a Netflix property. You get, <laughs> get you a Netflix original, have Netflix pay for it. I think it would be perfect for Netflix, personally. You know, but, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't disagree. MGM it's it's very complicated. You know, and, and, we just, and we did a Netflix original last year, you know, Alien Christmas. I actually haven't seen that one yet. Oh, it's Alien Christmas and Christmas is with an X, so it's Alien Xmas. Okay. It's a um, it's a holiday special we did with uh, John Favreau as our executive producer, um, kind of a throwback to the old Rankin and Bass uh, stop motion. Rudolph the Red-Nosed oh, Reindeer. Awesome. The town about a nasty ra race of aliens that um, land on Earth at the North <laughs> Pole and attempt to uh, you know, you know, steal our stuff. And Santa and the Elves are the first line of defense against this alien invasion. Uh, well, I know what I'll be watching uh, this Christmas time because I, I save all my Christmas movies for for that time. Well, it's, but it's, it's, it's there. It's there now. You can stream it if you want to have you know Christmas in April. Um, <laughs> it's it's streaming on Netflix now. Great, great. Uh, the thing is, I just got, I just heard that uh, that uh, Killer Clowns is no longer on Netflix. Yeah, it, it goes on cycles, you know. Um, yeah, it's not on now, but it'll, it'll, I'm sure it'll be back in some time. And if you go to Just Watch and put in Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and it'll tell you where where it's showing. It's probably on it'll probably, Prime. Yeah, it usually comes back in Halloween. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I see I, Comet TV plays it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I own it, so I can watch it anytime I want to, which is great. That's, that's what I like. You know? Yeah. That's I, I'm one of those guys. I gotta I gotta own it. So um, yeah. Uh, do see we don't no, have any. What other... Edward, Edward was saying that you know what, with all the money that's being spent, you got people making two hundred million dollar movies. You got studios like Netflix is turning out four thousand products. You know, uh, uh, you know, producing four thousand you know uh, projects. You know, a, a every year. So I you know. I, when we were offered the same money that we did Killer Clowns for 30 years ago, <laughs> we said, you know what, we could for that money, but we don't want to. You know, we're not going to work for free after being in the business, you know, for, for almost sure. 40 years now. And not make yeah, so, and don't make something call, subpar. You know what I mean? Come on, we, you we know? can't call in the same favors. We can't do the clown heads for twenty five thousand dollars anymore. We can't get you know Mark Sullivan to do matte paintings. You know for twenty five thousand. Fantasy two is not going to do visual effects for eighty thousand dollars. Right, right. You know what? You know what? You know what? We probably could because everyone we spoke to says they would love to do it. But yeah, the I brothers, I don't, I don't ask people to work for free anymore. We're not going to ask. <laughs> we're not going to ask anyone to work for free. Right. At MGM. I would work. I would work on the film for free. Just FYI, as a as you know, whatever you need, uh, we, camera wise, yeah. camera wise. Mm -hmm. I, I I even I used to second second uh, back in the day. 
And second, I, I was first AD on second unit. Um, but I don't I don't do the AD stuff anymore. I hate it. I'm I, I just do camera stuff now. <laughs> you know our our tendency our tendency is you know since we we made films since we were little you know with Super 8 we just got on our bikes and and we'd make movies and stuff. That even at our age, you know, 60 years later, you know, when someone says. You want to do Killer Clowns from Outer Space? Our childish love for the genre, we want to do it. Yeah. You know, we really want to do it. And unfortunately, that's taken advantage of, yeah, you know, that's, by the yeah. business of Hollywood. Yeah. I wish the business so, you know, of Hollywood so, like, was better. Well, like I said before, as far as like the official word on the sequel, there is no sequel. But again, that doesn't mean there isn't a desire. It doesn't mean that I'm not working, you know, a couple of different yeah. angles to make it happen. But, you know, who knows? You know, th- and in some ways, um, it, maybe it's better just to leave it as is, you know? It, it's killing clouds from outer space. Uh, all we could really do is maybe ruin it, tarnish it. So. <laughs> That's true. Hey, I mean, there, but go ahead. You know, did, didn't I hear that uh, MGM was approaching, uh, no, uh, that, that Disney was approaching MGM to buy no, MGM? It- no, that was. No, I mean, who knows? I mean, Disney can buy just about anybody, whether they do or they not. They bought everybody I else. Know. I don't know. I don't necessarily. I, I see an upside for Disney buying, buying MGM. You know, do they need James Bond? Do they need? They want it. 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 They've already done with the Wizard of Oz remakes, right? They want everything. Yeah, so they don't. I don't know. They want everything. Then, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, the yeah. rumor that. Uh, that Clowns was part of Fox when Disney bought it and Fox was going to be doing a sequel that Disney killed when they bought Fox. That's totally untrue. That Fox does not own Clowns. Who does? Do you guys own, do you MGM, guys own it? MGM. 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 MGM controls the copyright. Okay. If so, we owned it, we would have had eight sequels <laughs> and a TV series. Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, so we got a Question from Clementine Fox. If you could do an updated version to be more terrifying, what would you do differently? Well, I think we're better filmmakers now. So, yeah. um, you know, just the production value, the, the cutting pace, the, the photography would be upped a little bit. I mean, I think we, we I think all of us want to make the clowns a little more insane. Um, and that would make it a little more, you know, terrifying. Uh, we're not so much into the the, the horror gore slasher type stuff. Gore. I think you know, yeah. at, at its core, it's we call, we call them cotton, uh, you know, cotton candy kills, sugar coated kills. Yeah. So, um, but then, you know, I think there's a definite level. You know, I think we could build on the second half of the original in terms of like that vibe when they go into the, when Dave goes back into the, the police station. That's some pretty pretty good creeps there. So what if, what if they actually remade it. Would you sign off on a remake that was actually just pure terror and not campy at all? Or would you ever just sign off on a remake in general? They wanted to do um, a hard R blood fest, and we told them we'd rather not. Okay. You know, because killer clowns aren't about blood. You right. know, is uh, would the would the knock your block off scene been better? If blood spurted out of the torso, you know. So yeah, if you want a blood fest, you know, we don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, in, in all in all candor, there's more likely you'll see a reboot before you see our sequel. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's terrible to hear. I don't want to hear that. Let's, so here's what we I think we need to do: internet. So, let's, you know, let, let, let's get a Kickstarter going. I think the internet would pull together to literally just throw money at you if they knew you guys wanted to do a sequel. You know, They're not I throwing think it at us. The power, the power of the internet is really, you know, you need to let MGM know you need to, you want to see more clowns and you, and the Kyoto brothers need to do it. I mean, they're, some of the brain trusts there right now, I think on, do understand that and they've been very kind to us and we've had a lot of high level conversations that they do want to involve us in some way. But, you know, again, you think about the impression of clowns in 1986 when we started, 1987 when it came out, um, the world had a different view of clowns. Now in 2021, people don't trust clowns. They w- you would not send your kid up to a clown. Um, it's, a, it's a different world. So, 
you know, what does the killer clowns from outer space look like in 2021? I think it's a different movie. And like I said, yep. you know, sometimes maybe it's just best to leave it, you know, leave it alone. You know, fair, fair I mean, enough. I'm, I, it's a hard, it's a hard point to argue. You know what I mean? But yeah, I just, I mean, know... again, we, we would love to pick up the thread. You know, all this time later, you talk about what happened to the town. Well, we can't deal with the whole town, but we can deal with a character who was from that town and stayed there. Somebody whose life was so devastated. He's the, he's that guy on the street corner. The end is near, holding up that sign, warning everybody. And that's Mike Tobacco, whose life was exactly. destroyed by his clown thing. So yeah, we pick up we that have, story. We call it no, the trilogy, trilogy in four trilogy. parts. Yeah, but the trilogy in four parts. That's what we have. And you know what? We're going to skip from Killer Clowns 2. We're going to go right to 3, you know, because yeah. it's so long. No, that's great. But so, so Mike Tobacco becomes the new uh, gr uh, Farmer Green or, or uh, the guy the guy with Pooh Bear the dog. Is that, is that what Mike Tobacco, the crazy no, guy? And, and he's, <laughs> he's, he's a Luke Skywalker plane. that hands it off yeah. to the next, to the next generation. Know. And then the, then the subsequent film, we find out what happened to Debbie Stone. And then what yeah. happened to Dave, Dave the cop, you know? Speaking of Debbie, Suzanne, I think it's Snyder. Is that correct? Suzanne yeah. Snyder? Um, Suzanne Snyder starred in actually a few pretty big movies before she was ever cast in um, Killer Clowns. She was in yes. uh, Return of the Living Dead Follow Part 2. She was yeah. in Weird Science. Uh, and there was one other one that I can't think of off, off the top of my head that she was in. She was in a um, bunch of the John Hughes movies. We got her yeah. right off of Return of the Living Dead Part 2. Yeah, which she shooting that, and she moved right into, you know, our our project. Which is another campy, just pure camp, but just I love that horror film. Return of the Living Dead series is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, one of my favorites. You know, uh, a Susan a Suzanne Schneider story she tells us was that she was very tired just coming off of her last picture, and she wanted to take a break. Her agent said. You have to do this movie, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. <laughs> These guys are going places. But you know what? The movie went places, and we did okay. <laughs> but uh, it was her agent that actually talked her into doing Killer Clowns from Outer Space. So. Well, then we should all give uh, a round of applause to her agent. Check this out. Oh, yeah. I, have a, I, got some sound of, I got some sound effects here. Look at that. This production value on this stream is out of control, let me tell you guys. Um, so, um, well, what are you guys up to now? Let's, let me give you guys, uh, you know, a place to, to talk about what's coming up. What's going yeah, on? You know, um, you know, right now, we're actually, we, we're just coming off of a, a, like a two-year solid um, working, like more than that, two and a half, three, almost three years on Alien Christmas for Netflix and a, um, an independent stop motion feature that we just finished, we just wrapped in December that's finishing up post this month. Um, I can't tell you what the title is, but it's based on a, an internet property that has a huge following, uh, a little stop motion indie movie, what we made for uh, with Cinereach out of New York. And uh, hopefully that'll be, uh, they'll be able to make some announcements on that soon, but it's a very sweet project. So right now it's just really kind of recuperating and uh, okay. you know, just kind of uh, re-energizing the creative juices. So who knows? Uh, you know, maybe we get to do a little bit of a follow-up on our Alien Christmas show on Netflix or uh, some other stuff. Great. So yeah, is that... I get, yeah, yeah I, excuse me. I didn't get a chance to talk to, to Grant about his uh, uh, Willy Wonderland, you know? Yeah, That's yeah. right in line with a killer clown from outer space you know, premise. Crazy snuff. I'm glad to see that uh, I understand it's doing really well. Oh, I loved it. We actually talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the broadcast, um, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to ask him either, like, is Nick Nicolas Cage actually OCD in that film? Like, what's with him <laughs> with, the, with the timer and the punch pop and the washing of the hands? He's like, he's got to be just OCD or something, right? He's yeah, Nicolas it's a, Cage. It's a weird one. I mean, he's, he's so great. <laughs> Yeah, you know, to pull that off with no dialogue, just a lot right? of fun. Just grunting the whole time. It's it's fantastic. Okay. He said so much with his eyes. Like, exactly. I, I, yeah, love I mean, it. again, like, like you know, Grant. You know, again, when they uh, when they were hatching the you know the story, you know, the 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 
trying to get the project off the ground. Grant, Adam Rifkin, who's an EP on the movie, they're for all friends of ours. They came to us. We had a great meeting with the director, and we just we were just just about to go into production on Alien Christmas, and I, I just couldn't couldn't do it. So uh, right. we had recommended uh, Ken Hall's Total Fabrication to make the costumes, and then they did a great job. Terry Fluker, uh, B.J. Geyer, a bunch of really talented people. Um, Judy Bowerman, you know, made those costumes. Tony Double, in fact, actually, during Christmas break, when we were in a, a Christmas hiatus on Alien Christmas, you know, we let them uh, build some of the stuff in our shop. So uh, that's yeah, awesome. It's, uh, we're disappointed we didn't get to actually go work on it, but uh, uh, it, was a, it was a blast. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled that they're having all the success they are. Oh, absolutely. And I love the designs in that film, too, like all the different. Uh, Creature, animatronic creatures. Uh, it was, they were really, really good. Uh, so, um, suitably creepy. Suitably creepy. Absolutely, I love it. Um, so, what are some of the other uh, f- horror films, or even any other kind of genre film? Because you know, I love, I love movies of all genres, um, but horror is my favorite. Um, wh- what are some of the ones you've seen? You might want would recommend to people to watch right now. Some of your favorites, maybe we've seen lately. Yeah, well, well was, I haven't seen. You know, it's funny. I, I worked throughout the entire pandemic. I didn't get right. to binge anything. Well, you're lucky. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, you know the uh, the Quiet Place. I didn't. I haven't seen. I, I haven't seen the uh, the sequel to Quiet Place, but it looks it looks intense. Oh, it's not out yet. Yeah, I like the, uh, yeah, I like the. the the first quiet place i like movies like that i like monster movies i've been catching up on some low budget you know creature movies with some really neat you know uh, effects i'm looking forward to uh, the the descent is an incredibly Absolutely. disturbing feature the creatures the the transcended you know men in costumes they were living creatures. The close-up on those things looked like animals to me. They weren't human. Um, sure. um, the original descent. The the sequel wasn't quite as good. The the suits looked sure. like guys in suits. Right. But the first one was you know extraordinary. I understand that the director has just done another film, you know, in that genre, and I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to see if I could find that, you know, on streaming. But um, sure. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm a sucker for any monster movie. Um, I haven't seen yeah, I mean, Kong yet. I want to get to the theater. But, uh, you know, a, a, an inter- interesting bit of trivia is Paul Mason, our executive producer on Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Um, didn't didn't he, he produce and didn't he rewrite? He wrote, he wrote the, uh, the English version of uh, King Kong versus Godzilla, the original. 68? <laughs> oh, Paul Mason. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so we have, have, we have that. Uh, the Japanese movies, but then you need the English, the sure. English version of it. He wrote that. So it's funny when we went to his office to do the pitch. He has a, he has this big poster of King Kong and Godzilla, the movie poster, and it's written by Paul Mason. Oh, that's rad. That's totally cool. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. I mean, like funny. As soon as the theaters opened here in L.A., I uh, grabbed my grandkid and. Uh, Grandson and we went to see Kong uh, Godzilla versus Kong in the big theater because I had to see it in a, sure. in a big theater. Yeah, I, um, I I didn't get to yet. Uh, I haven't been to the theater yet. I just got vaccinated about a week and a half ago, so I'm like right on the cusp of ready to get out there and get back into the real world and go to the yeah, movies. Actually, and it, it was a, it was a great experience. Everybody was it was assigned seating. Nobody was in anywhere near us. It was it was great. It was like having almost having the theater to ourselves. It was, a, and I mean, again, not not a great movie, but a great experience in the big theater. I actually know Adam Wingard, the director of that film. I met him during South by Southwest one year, and we've kept in touch. Um, so I'm not going to tell him you said that it wasn't that great of a movie, but <laughs> you know, no, I, I, it's just you know, it's funny. I, then I hear, you know, I hear in an interview that he said, you know, we have, we have enough we have enough footage to make a four hour version. Well, you know. I, I almost would want to see the four hour version because this right. is, this, this version is so choppy. You just jump from here to here to here, and there's so right. much so much structure that's just missing. So you know, so much fiber that's mm-hmm. missing. 
uh, that you know things that I would I would have liked to have seen that tied the movie together better for me. I think but, we I mean, just got to wait for the Blu-ray. We got to wait for the Blu-ray. You know, it's two hours yeah. nonstop. It's kick-ass. My grandson loved it. Oh yeah, it's a great monster flick. I mean, it's a beat 'em up. Who lo- I mean, who doesn't love that? Yeah, no, yeah. And that's you, that's the thing. I just you know I hate going to movies where if you've watched all the extended trailers, you've seen everything. Right. I I, I like to you know just you know, get excited about the premise and then see it all in a theater. You know, sometimes I, I think they give too much away in in the trailers. Right. You know, but they have to sell they have to get yeah, they have to get you in, in into the theaters and well, right now. And I, get but, you I, watch. but I also think it's part of the the new like instant gratification culture that's kind of built in right. To what's going on right now with the internet and streaming and and whatnot, you know, it's 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 not like it used to be where you know you would have to go to the theater to see the trailer for a film, yeah, and, you know, and the, you would never got there late because if you got there late, you missed all the previews for the movies. There were no ads. There's no ads. They were ju- it was just just trailers, and that was like some of the best parts of going to the movie, but. I'm bl- I'm blown away at the level of production. You know how to how a director, you know, previses that. You know how to keep oh. just all those elements. It's a it's no a way. it's a staggering achievement on that level, regardless of you know whether I think it has you know the connective tissue to to do it. And the thing you know the the reality is those movies it delivered on what you you went to see on. It's you wanted to see the two titans fight. And, That's uh, exactly right. More than delivers on that. Oh, there's actually, the, there's the thing. There, there are a couple yeah, of shots the at the end, man. That it just, it just, um, you just feel like you're watching the old Godzilla movies, the way it was right. framed and the, the staging of it. But obviously, the the execution was, you know, top notch. So it's just really funny, kind of like, wow, that that's really cool. It felt very, very familiar, very, very comfortable. And totally, I really I totally, I totally agree. I think he did reach both the older generation and the newer generation with the yeah. film. I think he achieved that. So and then people are, you know, you know, people were wondering, you know, 30 years later, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, we're not going to be making a King Kong versus Godzilla non-stop action thing. You know, you know, the world isn't aware of the Killer Clowns. It's not Independence Day. Killer clowns work best when they sneak up on a small group of people and lure them in and then do their thing. If they're just coming down with clown weapons and taking over the world, that's not what that's not how clowns operate. People said, "Well, what do the clowns want?" We said that maybe they're here for a bite to eat. Well, that's true. But the thing about it, you know what? The clowns are here to fuck around. Yeah, right. You know, they think it's funny. They're here to fuck around. Shits and giggles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and cotton candy uh, body bags. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, again, again, we joke about the trilogy in four parts. But, you know, imagine yeah. at the end of the story, one of our characters is on the brink of the, the presidency of the United States and the, in, the, in the midst of a massive clowns invasion, something he's been, not, been denying for 30 years. And like, now he has as president of the you know leader of the free world that he ha- he's come to reckon with his past and the, and the clown invasion. Independence and then, you know, Day Boston, with clowns. Clown yeah, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of the opportunities you know that that are available for a TV series for a long arcing TV series. You know, the the, the clown planet. You know, right? Uh, the, the 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 clowns. You know. You know, going back in time. You know, you know all of that stuff. That's the clown universe. We we pitch it, but they want to give us two million dollars to do it. And what's weird is there's not a lot of circuses around now like there used to be. You know what I mean? You don't. They really... got rid of that. They're getting rid of zoos. They're getting rid of the aquariums. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess they were treating clowns badly, so I had to get rid of the circus. I don't... <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean travel. Yeah, I mean there, there are there are so you know Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. They're gone. You know they they got rid of their animal acts yeah. long ago. You know Circus Vargas. I imagine they'll they'll be coming back to some degree. Um, well, but Circus yeah, I mean, Soleil. It, 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 yeah, 
They're using holograms. Cirque du Soleil is using holograms. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah. now you, you know, uh, I heard Broadway now. They're doing things with uh, with projection screens and stuff now instead of sets. No, right. Yeah, you yeah. know, I heard there's that technology being done. So, so if there were a sequel, they would obviously the clowns would have to evolve to be able to fit in here on Earth. Maybe they could like become carnies, just regular car, <laughs> or something like that. Because we you still know, got carnivals they'll around. They <laughs> they'll do anything they can, and you know, the the the, the universe is, is is just wide open for premises and possibilities. There's nothing that's too ridiculous in the clown universe. You know what really? And, you know what the reason is. Because they're clowns, that's why. Right. You know what really bugs me? There's 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 one killer clowns from outer space with no sequel, but yet there's five Sharknados. What? Yeah. Come, come on, man. Come on. You that's know, the, the kind the of world Sharknado's, I'm living in. <laughs> they're done for. They're done for two million dollars, and you know, there's a certain level of expectation. Right. You know, and actually. Sharknado got better ratings than Killer Clowns did, so <laughs> uh, it's yeah. yeah, it's 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 maybe they could say it's like kind of like the the new generation's Killer Clowns or something, but I, it, yeah. for me it's it's just not as genius, like not nowhere near. It's more just like oh, let's throw some celebrities in this really shitty like C movie and kill them off with flying sharks and and that's it. Yeah, but no heart, no heart. Maybe we live best left alone because I can't say any of the Halloween reboots, any of the Leatherface reboots have ever touched the originals. You know, Scream, that'd be interesting, you know, see what they do with that. I thought that was, the you know, the first couple of Screams were really clever. You know, right. um, you know, Saw, I think, is right. a, a franchise, though it's not my particular. I don't I don't love that type of thing, but I think they're right. really smart. I think that the first sure. couple of done really well. Right. Um, you know, so we'll see. Well, a, the, a guy I know who's a who's a who's a DP here in Austin. He actually got hired to direct the latest Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, that's it's done filming, so I don't. Uh, but he said it's it's going to be bloody and good. But you know, we'll yeah. see. We'll see. Um, and uh, and I've also been talking with the directors of the new Scream, uh, Radio Silence. Um, and everything I hear about that is that it's uh, very much in the vein of Wes Craven, um, that they paid really good homage to him. So I've got I've got big hopes for that one. Here, because yeah. again, he was very he was very self aware. He knew exactly what he, what they were doing in the in the first one. It's just really really smart. They were playing fun. They had fun with the genre and then took it to another level. And you know, right? No, totally agree. Well, um, guys, if you have anything else... Oh, there's one thing I wanted to show you. Since I got the special effects masters who make masks here on my stream, I actually painted a Jason mask from Friday the 13th myself. My first ever, first ever mask I've ever painted myself. So I wanted to show it to you and get your reactions, and you can tell me what you think. Oh. <laughs> cool, cool. It I was going like to say don't quit your day job, but it's a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's literally the first mask I've ever done in my entire life. So, no, That's a good one. Huh. Good well, one. thank you. I'm, I'm going to put that on my Instagram. Kyoto Brothers said, that's a good one. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Um, man, I would love to have you back pleasure. anytime you want to be on the show. This is actually my first live stream interview. Did you guys know that? No, did not. Oh, it's great to be a part of it. So you guys literally were my first live stream interview, and uh, you guys knocked it out of the park. And I'm really glad you guys showed up uh, to the show. And thank you so much for being here and sharing your stories. And uh, yeah, anytime you guys want to talk or come on, I'm, I'm willing to put you on, and we can talk more <laughs> movies. Keep it, keep it in mind, we'll and then we'll hopefully we can get to Austin soon. Awesome. Great. Great. Yeah, look me up. Cool, cool. Right. Well, thank you, guys. We will. I appreciate I, it. Take care. Well, Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. How do I get it? It's all right. Just click the X. <laughs> I can kick you out. Here we go. <laughs> all right, guys. That is... 
the stream. Uh, I think it went really well. Um, they had some really great stories to tell. So, um, yeah, I might just, uh, yeah. That was fun, right? Totally fun. Uh, wow. Yeah. Sorry, I'm kind of decompressing. That was a that was like a good hour, hour and a half. I don't know. So um, yeah, I guess I'll get off of here and go chill out for a little bit. I might stream a little bit later. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in for that two. That was a two hour stream, by the way, two hours. So thank you guys, uh, and I will see you soon.